Well, good morning. If you're joining on us, joining us online, I want to welcome you as well. We are glad that you are here at Berean and worshiping with us this morning. If I can, encourage you to take your copy of the scripture and turn to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 17, Luke chapter 17, and we'll begin in verse 11 this morning, Luke 17 and verse 11. Right after uh, 9-11, actually prior to 9-11, myself, my wife, and a group of people were planning to go on a short-term mission trip to Ghana, West Africa, and then when we spent our time there over into to Togo. And um, of course, 9-11 happened, and that threw a lot of wrenches into the plan, but God still enabled us to go. And um, as we went to, to Togo, um, we were able to visit what is called today the South Hospital. It's often referred to it as that. Um, and at the South Hospital or near it on the compound, there is also a, a blind center. And um, the blind folks there, uh, a, a gal by the name of Kay Washer, um, actually started that ministry, and it was a ministry that was really foreign um, to the people there in Africa, that people would take the time and take the effort to, to help those that did not have sight. But um, right outside of that, we took a picture, and this is actually the actual photograph um, that we took during that time. And you can't read the, the headstones, but to the left, um, there was a, uh, a marker for a what we call a pioneer missionary, somebody that went in the early days um, in the ministry with ABWE and helped start these ministries that were there. And his name was Dal Washer. Now, some of you may have heard of Dal Washer. His, his wife, Kay, wrote a biography about his life called One Candle to Burn. And the reason she titled that is because Dal looked at his life as a candle that was being burned up and used up for the cause of Christ. And he had, if you read that biography, there's many sayings that he had, but one of the sayings that he referred to a lot was this, and it's there on your screen. It says, yes, Lord, I will spend or be spent as a candle which is lit. And it gives out light, but in order to give out light, it consumes itself in the interest of bringing light to others until there comes a time when it sputters out for the very last time And that candle is consumed. And about his life, he said, I will gladly spend and be spent and sputter out someday in Togo. I will gladly spend and be spent, and I love the word he used, and sputter out someday for a Savior. Jesus, in his earthly ministry, was traveling all throughout Galilee, He was teaching in the synagogues. He was proclaiming the good news of the gospel. He was casting out demons. He was healing every kind of sickness. His healing ministry, which exceeded, at times, our own understanding, simply did this. It gave evidence of his deity. It gave evidence that he was indeed God. It gave authenticity to the message that he spoke. And as a result, crowds followed him seeking physical healing, and some also found spiritual healing. Those people learned to call him Master and Lord. When we think of the word Master or Lord, it is is someone who carries the idea that has power, has authority, or control over others. It's oftentimes a, a term that is used to show honor and respect. Matthew shares with us Jesus' own word speaking about himself when he says, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has given, been, been given to me. When a believer recognizes him as master, it indicates his submission to the truth of the gospel. It also indicates his submission to the call that he has placed on the life of that individual. Our challenge today, our thought today, is to call 
him master, to lay down everything and call him master. Dow's life indicated, as we've read this morning, I will gladly spend, and I'll gladly be spent, until someday I sputter out for Jesus. Today's passage from the Gospel of Luke describes an actual event. However, like the parables, it's rich with spiritual truth and rich, has rich application for our life. Look with me, see the story that magnifies his divine goodness, his compassion, his grace. Let's look at some of the details of 10 sick men who found healing, yet only one returned to truly recognize him as master. Look at your scripture and read with me the introduction to our passage today. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, he was met by ten leopards who stood at a distance. They lifted up their voices and they said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us, have compassion on us. The account or the story begins in between Galilee, Samaria. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, which is in the south there in Judea. But he was today, or in this account, between an in-between place between Samaria and Galilee. Samaria is a region that's just north of Jerusalem Jerusalem there in Judea. In Jesus' day, the, the Jewish people of Galilee and the people of Judea They shunned the Samaritans. They viewed them as an impure race who practiced a half-pagan religion. It was a place that was completely, if possible, avoided by the Orthodox Jew. This is where we find Jesus today. And while we do not live there in Samaria, I think we can draw some similarities to the culture or similarities to the culture of today, to the culture that we live in, that we are called to minister in. It is here we find our first truth and application. Jesus, Jesus often calls you to serve him in an in-between place, a place between what you know and uncertainty. The Samaritan people, in the eyes of the Jews, were despised. They hated them. They would never have expected Jesus to heal or to save these people. It was a culture which had been deemed to have act or spoken in an unacceptable manner and as a result was being ostracized, boycotted, and shunned. Well, I don't directly compare our culture to the culture of the day. I think we can see some similarities of today's cancel cultures. When I compare the cancel culture of today, there are definitely some similarities. I think we can draw some application from this in-between place where we find Jesus today. See, oftentimes we look around in our world, we see our Christian and biblical viewpoints. They're less and less tolerated. They're deemed inappropriate there be an attempt, there's an attempt to have them scrubbed from our society or from places we do business. It's sad. To me, at times, it's difficult and troubling to see people dismiss what is true for what is a lie. However, it's in this in-between place, it's in this cancel culture that we live today. And as we call him master, we are also called to live in that place. Sometimes we are given opportunity to minister. Sometimes we are given opportunity to share or care for people. Sometimes our first response is to avoid that opportunity. Sometimes it's to make excuses. Or sometimes, deep down, we're just going to refuse to engage personally people with our time, and ultimately, we hope, with the gospel. We live in a world that, to us, is increasingly foreign, 
I mean, oftentimes we struggle to be in it, but not to be of it. I'm reminded of Jesus' prayer for us, his high high priestly prayer. He was praying for those that were his own, and he says this, I have given them your word. The world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so that they can be made holy by your truth. Our Savior, who completely understands us, who is sympathetic to us, is praying and today that we would be holy, we'd be obedient, we would be faithful to his call in this in-between place. We must be reminded in this in-between place that your daily routine will likely present you with opportunities where your first instinct is to avoid involvement. You're liable to come across opportunities where our first instinct is to run. We read in the text today, on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem where he would eventually pay the price for your sin and mine on the cross. He was on his way to do that, but in this story, he was moving through that in-between place. And when he was, he was confronted with ten sick men. He was confronted with ten sick men. Now, I could easily see reasons why I would not want to keep, where I'd like to just keep moving and, and remove myself from that situation. Notice the interaction that he had with these folks. On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee, And as he entered the village, as he just got into town, he was met by ten sick people. They stood at a distance because the law said they had to. They stood at a distance and they were yelling at him. They lifted their voices and they said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. I could see lots of reason if I was in that situation that I would not want to involve myself. These were people I didn't know. Not only were they people I don't know, but they were sick. They were yelling at me. It would be like today pulling up into the parking lot and somebody yelled at you across the parking lot. It would get you attention and immediately you would put up barriers or consider at least to put up barriers. There were people that you didn't know. And in this case, the law said they had to stay away from me. And I knew that. I think to further understand these men in this situation, we need to understand a little bit about what the culture said about leprosy or what the law said about leprosy. If you wanted some really good reading, and I'm kidding just a little bit here, if you were to turn to Luke, or not Luke, excuse me, Leviticus uh, 13, chapter 13 and chapter 14, there's two chapters about the law of how the people were to handle people with leprosy. And I've read it several times preparing for our time together today, and it's quite confusing, to be quite honest with you. It's very detailed, and it's quite confusing. So I won't take you there, and I won't go through all that, but I do want you to to see and to hear how it was flushed out and how it might have affected this interaction that Jesus was having with the men and the thoughts that the men might be having about Jesus, but also the people that they came into contact with every day. You see, a leopard was told to avoid, really, everyone. They were were seeking to stop the spread, and so they were told they had to live outside of 
the cities. That's why we find them there today. He's coming into the city. That's where the lepers are. They were told they had to allow their hair to grow long and shaggy so that people would easily identify them. They were told they had to wear torn and ragged clothes for the same reason so they were easily identified. They were told in the law that people had to remain six feet from them. They had to stay six feet from everybody. I think his, his history also tells us, and this is, I think, above and beyond, beyond what the law said. They said on windy days they had to stay 150 feet away. Can you imagine? When they were living there at the edge of town, when people came by, they were told they had to, to yell out to the passers-by, unclean, unclean, so that people knew. They either had to live alone or they had to live with others with the same disease, which is why in our story today, probably the only reason we would see a Samaritan with those that were not Samaritans, that were Jews. And to top it all off, it was often believed that they had leprosy because of what they had done because of their own sin. And the only way that they could be declared clean or they could enter re-enter society as if they went to a priest and he even determined if they were still unclean or if they were clean indeed and they could go back into society imagine the thoughts of these men hear their their thoughts as they speak they said jesus the word jesus means god of our salvation. Master simply means someone who has power or authority. Have mercy. And the word mercy there just means have compassion on us. Consider our condition. Consider our plight. See, we're daily confronted with the sin of our world. It's not hard to see the results of that sin not hard to look out and see people that are hurting. Oftentimes people that are being mistreated. Sometimes I think our first response is fear. And not moving towards but moving away. We rationalize and sometimes even convince ourselves to avoid any responsibility that the Lord might have given us. We forget we are in the world to give truth and shed light. We forget the power of the gospel. We forget how it changed us. We forget that Jesus has the power to produce miraculous change in hard situations. He can make changes miraculously. And I think sometimes we forget where we came from. I love what the Scripture says about our past, those who have trusted the Lord as their savers, Savior, it says, and you, that means me, who were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God has made you alive together with him, having forgiven us or forgiving you all your transgressions or trespasses. I often say when I look at that word dead, you know what dead means? It means you were dead. You had nothing to offer. There is nothing you could do. You were dead. Jesus has the power to change. Some of you have heard my own personal story. I was saved at an early age, but there was a time in my life, my teenage years and in early adult years, my heart was a rebellious. I was a rebellious teenager. I rebelled from my parents, and by doing so, I rebelled from my father. And I'm still amazed today that he would allow me to do what I'm doing in front of you now. That he would say, Jim, I want to use you. I want to use a rebellious teenager folks remember he is never caught off guard and he is never caught off guard where he leads you 
Jesus is never caught off guard. In contrast, he knows you intimately, and he knows the way that you go intimately. There's many times in my life and in my ministry that I've been caught off guard. I remember this past summer, I was doing a a little home improvement project. I was down in the basement. Karen came down the stairs, and, and she was a little bit out of sorts. And she said, there's a guy at the door, and he needs something. My first reaction, well, what does he need? <laughs> so I, I said, I'll be right up. So I followed her up the stairs, and I get to the, to the door, and there's a gentleman in a leather vest with no shirt, pants to be similar, his motorcycle's dead in my driveway, and he's asking me for gasoline. And I said, I'd love to give you some gasoline, but literally I just poured the rest in my lawnmower. How else can I help you? And then he said to me, I live up the street. I was caught off guard because you know what that meant? I just offered him a ride. (laughs) And I look at my wife and I kiss her goodbye. No. (laughs) (laughs) I was caught off guard. The Lord protected me. I took him up. I knew no new neighbor. He lived about a mile up. Haven't seen him, hadn't seen him before, haven't seen him since. But I was definitely caught off guard. I remember after morning service quite a few years ago, I had some of my church people that were a little bit anxious, and they came to me and they said, Pastor, Pastor, there's a man here. We think he's homeless. What should we do? I said, Invite him in. <laughs> and they said, No, you got to go talk to him. So I go talk to him, and I was caught off guard by the response of of our church people, but also his response. You know what he wanted? He just wanted a blanket. Just wanted a blanket. And I said, hey, come on back, and we'll give you a blanket. But I was caught off guard in those situations. I remember my first summer, after my first year of college, I was working at a summer camp, and the speaker got up and spoke and gave an invitation, and one of my campers wanted to get saved. I don't know why I was caught off guard. I was, because I wasn't ready. And I had to, now I enjoy to, but there I had to share the gospel. And I was caught off guard. But folks, our God, our Lord and Savior, He's never, never caught off guard. Notice what our text says. When he saw them, he said to them, and I want us to key in for just a moment on that word saw because it's an interesting word. It means to see, yes, but there's a deeper meaning and it means to know. So when Jesus knew them, when he knew them, he really saw them, he really knew them. He knew that they were lonely that they were embarrassed, that they had little finances. There was no government programs helping these men. They had no health care. They lacked hope. They lacked ambition, and they lacked direction. I often pray, and and I've heard some of you say it too, God, help me see people the way you see them. Because I don't. I get so busy in the day or I get so busy with my goals or what I'm trying to accomplish. I wish at times I would be better at just taking some time to get to know them, to hear about their lives. Yet in those moments, I also realize my role, I can't know what He knows, but he can point them out to me for sure. But my role is to serve people, to love people. And yet at the same time, by action, by my action and by my attitude, by my example, to point them to Jesus, who will meet them just where they are. Jesus who is full of mercy, who is full of compassion, will meet 
you where you are today. Jesus, who is full of mercy and compassion, will meet you where you are today. The word mercy simply means compassion. He did not allow the culture to dictate his interaction. It did not matter to him that the culture says we should hate. He did not look down on them because they were already ostracized from society. He met them. And the text says he knew them. As we're going to learn in our story, he knew, he knew them, but they did not know him. He simply said to them, go and show yourselves to the priest. Change happens. I want you to see this. The change happened with these men as they were going. Change happens as you go, trusting the Lord in what you cannot possibly see. I am sure that part of the reason these men were calling out to Jesus is because they had heard stories and healings that he had already done. Maybe they heard of the account we find in Luke chapter 4 where Jesus went to Simon's mother's house. He stood over her and the fever left her. Maybe they had heard that. In the same chapter, Luke gives us account that they brought the sick. And many of those were also possessed with demons. And he touched them. He laid their hands on them. In chapter 5 of Luke, it talks about a, another man with leprosy who came to Jesus, and Jesus touched them, and he laid their hands on him, and he was healed immediately. Or maybe they heard of the paralyzed man whose friends couldn't get him near to Jesus, and so they, they took him up on the roof, and they cut a hole in the roof, and they dropped him down in front of Jesus, and Jesus said, it's your faith that has healed you, I'm sure they heard these things. And yet Jesus is some, saying something very different to them. He's not coming near. He's not standing over. He's not touching. It's not front and center to them. He stayed at the distance. He didn't start a dialogue. He didn't touch them. He didn't come near. No. He simply spoke. He spoke a word. Here Jesus simply says, go to the priest. Obviously they were to go to the priest so that they could be declared clean. These men didn't question. The story doesn't say that. They simply went. And as they went, they were healed. I'm sure. I'm sure he was testing their faith. But I think he was also reminding them and reminding us of the reliability of the Scripture or the reliability of his word. It's ironic here that the priests that they were told to go see would have been the same priests that rejected Christ. They would, when these men arrived, would have to examine them They would have to observe them for a period of eight days to see if indeed the disease stayed away, did not come back. They would have had to offer sacrifices for these men. It's ironic that the same men that rejected Christ would be confronted daily and for a period of eight days with the deity of the one they rejected. I want to give you a couple thoughts or applications as we just pause here for a second. Some thoughts and applications as you go trusting, as you trust Jesus and and go, that they can make drastic change in your life. As you go, here's the first one, as you go, he can use you, he can use your gifts to bring about change in the lives of others. Now, I understand that when we talk personally about our own strengths and our own gifts, 
most of us would say, I don't have much to offer. But the application is that as you go and as you trust, God can and does use your efforts to change the life of others. There's many times as a pastor over the years that I find myself in life and death situations. There's times I've been called early in the morning and said, come quickly, so-and-so is nearing the end of their life. Or I go to the hospital to visit somebody and the hospital said, bring in the family because the time's not long. And I'll be honest with you, as I'm going, this is what my thoughts are going through my head. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to react or how I'm supposed to respond. I, oftentimes you don't know the family. But yet I've learned that if I'm willing to go, he will give me the words to say or not say. Sometimes it's not say. Here's the second one. Second application. It, it is faith in the master. And it's faith in his word that will set you free. There may be someone here today that never met Jesus. They've never trusted by faith that what he completed on the cross would save them, would save you. Maybe there's someone here today and it's by faith that you can know Jesus. As you are going, never forget the one who sent you. As you are going, never forget the one who sent you. Let's look at the remaining part of our passage today. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has healed you. I am convinced, I am sure, that all ten men were excited about the possibility of returning to their families, to see their friends that they hadn't seen for a long time, to re return to some normalcy of life, to be able once again to maybe find employment or work a job to pay and to get what they needed. But in the story today, only one, one of the ten was broken only one returned thankful. Only one found complete healing as he returned in gratitude to the one who would become his Savior. I want you to consider just for a moment how the leper returned to Jesus. He came shouting praises. It gives the idea that as he neared Jesus, he was yelling at him already. Praise the Lord for what you did. And as he got closer and as he got right in front of Jesus, he didn't stop and start talking to him. By his action, he showed his humility and his, his desire for salvation. He fell on his face, prostrate in the dirt. And as he was there in the dirt, he repeatedly, it seems, said, thank you, thank you, Lord, for what you did. Surely this man, too, wanted to be back in society, to see his family, to live in community, to be accepted once again. However, he wanted acceptance from his Savior. He wanted salvation, and so he alone returned to call him Master. 
the headwind of your culture says take what you can get. In contrast, always remember what you have in Jesus. In contrast, always remember what you have in Jesus. Luke points out the headline of the culture. He wants us to see the irony of this story. He wants us to see that Samaritans were not accepted. Jews would not expect this one to be saved. So he places emphasis on the irony by asking three rhetorical questions. The questions were asked to make a point. They weren't really meant, I don't think, to be answered. Look at the three questions that they asked. Didn't I heal ten? If I wanted to put it in my words, it might be there were ten, right? Then he asked, where are the other nine? I would say, where's the rest? Now, we could answer that question. I assume they're at the priest so they can get back to life as normal. But he's making a point. The third question was, is there no one else except this one? And he highlights the fact that he's a Samaritan. I would ask, where are the people that should be here, the people of the covenant, where did they go? You see, Jesus often does a work and those we would least expect him to do work. We never know what God will do or how God will use us, but we are to remain faithful. Your master this morning is calling you, despite what you think your abilities are, or despite what abilities you think you have. First Corinthians has been a passion that has meant a lot to me over the years. When I think about my calling, What God has asked me to do, it reads like this, For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you who were called were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were from a noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in this world to shame the wise, and God chose what is weak in this world to shame the wise. The strong. And if you were to read a little farther in that passage, it was the reason was stated that that nobody would boast and be able to say, I did it. But it goes beyond that. When people in the world look at us, they say, Well, it's not that guy. He doesn't have that ability. It must be God. It must be God. Know this truth. Your trust will never be displaced if your trust is in Jesus. Your trust will never be displaced if your trust is in Jesus. He ends our story today saying, it's your faith that has made you well. The word well there means to save, to deliver, or to be made whole. The word well means to save, to deliver, or to be made whole. It's different than the other words that show healing in this same passage. The word healed earlier on in the passage simply means to cure. The word cleanse simply means to clean up or to to purify. But here the word is sodezo. It means you've been saved. It means you've been delivered and you've been made whole. He alone is now worthy to be called your master. Let's review just a moment. We end our time this morning. Jesus often calls you to serve him in an in-between place. A place between what you know and uncertainty. Jesus is never caught off guard. by, And by contrast, he knows you intimately. And he knows those who you will minister to intimately. And as you go, never forget, never forget the one who sent you. We should never forget the lepers of our society, those who are broken, those whose lives are a mess, those who are hurting, the disillusioned, the broken. You see, it's Jesus they need to learn to call Master. It's Jesus they need to learn to give all 
to Him and for Him. We're not off the hook. We too must rise each day. Every day when we get out of bed, we must rise each day and call Him Master. Or as Dal Washer did, I am gladly spent or excuse me, I will gladly spend and be spent. Someday I'm going to sputter out for Jesus. Someday I'll sputter out. Look at the candles as we close. Look at these candles that were once bright. Now are just wax on the table. I will gladly spend and be spent. And someday I'll sputter out for you, Jesus. Let's pray together as we close. Father, we do thank you for who you are. We thank you for your son, Jesus. Father, my, my heart goes out to these that are here today, those that are watching online. Father, I, I trust that there's someone that doesn't know you. And I pray that they would too, like the leopard in our story today, come to you and find forgiveness of their sins. Father, I pray also that you would help us, your church, to see people the way you see people, to take time to get to know them. As you put opportunities in our path, that we would see you in that, that you're directing and that you're moving and that we would do what you've called us to do and minister to these folks. Father, I also pray for opportunities. I pray that when they come, you would show them to us that we might be light in this dark, dark, dark world. Father, we look forward to the day when we'll stand before you and see our Master. And we too will be able to, at your feet, give you thanks and praise for the work that you did in our life. We look forward to that day. We thank you for the hope that it brings. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.